Maureen Tange from MT Art Agency. Welcome to Irish Startup TV. Thank you for having me. So we're live from, uh, you're in London right now. Yes, we are, yeah. Uh, we're on Amazing. Museum Street, actually, which is very cliche for an art company. Oh, wow. It's one of the nicest uh, spots in London, actually. So tell us a little bit about MT Art Agency. So basically, I created the company three and a half years ago. So I've been in the industry for about 10 years. Um, I was a young gallery director at age 21. I got, I was very lucky. I was working with Banksy, JR, Connor Hankton, so a lot of the street artists. Then I got approached by an investor to be sent to LA and open my own art gallery. And when I had my gallery there, I basically got exposed to all the top Hollywood agencies, the guys that built the top sportives, musicians, actors. And I felt that actually the gallery model was just not the most exciting model to be building the top visual artists. And no one had an agency model um, in our industry. So that's kind of really the thing that inspired me to create the first uh, visual artist agency um, when I came back to London. Oh, that's incredible. Now, a friend of mine was with Bonham, so I have a little bit of an understanding. But if somebody is watching and they're not too familiar with the, um, the art business, what exactly is the gallery model? So the gallery model is basically like a shop and then you sell objects which are displayed on the shop and you very much have um, shop timings to get into the shop. So in the same way that maybe you had that 10 years ago, fashion had a bit of a retail crisis. Uh, currently, galleries have the same, where two sort of galleries are not making money, just because it's very fixed, it's very, it's very attached to a physical space, um, and it also means you can't therefore adapt or grow or scale really quickly. Um, so the idea of the agency is the exact opposite. So you don't just think of objects, you think of talents, and you invest in people. So by the second, someone will be jumping into the agency. They'll be financed monthly by us. You also have a whole team that help building the profile in terms of their name, making them famous, making them recognize, obtaining the best contracts for them. And you're also much more flexible in responding constantly in the top offers that your talents can get. Amazing. So I certainly know that um, I make videos and I do interviews and the interviews I've, I've never charged startups for. But when I work uh, commercially with uh, commercial video and more recently with photography, I find it really difficult to have a pricing conversation when it comes to um, to something that's visual, like a photograph or a video. Um, obviously, there are economical way of looking at these things, but it can be very difficult to have the business conversations. Do you find that the artist you're representing would face a similar challenge, that it's difficult yeah. to be creative and business minded concurrently? But I think it's also really hard to pitch yourself in general. So like, I think if you I will find it a lot easier to pitch for my artists, my business and uh, pitching myself uh, directly in that sense, uh, just because you are so passionate about what you do that you obviously want to do it. Um, so it's much easier to have that's someone exactly, that advocates. That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the same with any talent industries. I think it's also the case that um, I want them to spend as much time creating amazing art and art projects. So I don't really want them to be too drained. Uh, by the business side of things, because if you are in the business side of things, you can tend to, you know, to have an inbox that's exploding and all the things that we know from the business point, um, which might not free your mind to actually be creating the best works as well. Yeah, it makes so much sense. And uh, how long uh, have you been running uh, this operation for? And since you started, have you seen uh, many other people from maybe incumbent uh, sports or movie agencies uh, trying to enter into this market? Yeah, so basically there's three talent agencies in the world. So UTA, ECA, William Morris will pass a billion mark in terms of valuation for their company. And UTA has tried to venture into uh, the visual artist space. The issue of all of this is that you need the strong respect of our industry. And the reason our industry is very different is because my artists will get famous if they get into a museum. And that is non-commercial, it's completely intellectually based, um, and it's based by experts as well. So even if it does 10 Nike campaigns and sells to thousands of people, that can't secure him a museum show. So you need to basically be promoting them both on the commercial space and the non-commercial space. So to give you an idea, uh, Martis Leo Cayenne in Paris currently has 40 meters installation at the airport Orly and also has a, an exhibition with Le Louvre. So that gives you a non-commercial project here for his name and credibility in the industry and a very commercial opportunity. So that's a difficulty and that's the reason why um, agency have actually struggled to break in that space because they have a much more commercial kind of ways of establishing those hands and you have to do both 
uh, for our industry. So that gives us hopefully a few years to be the best um, before they can pour millions at trying to be more competitive. We do have more agencies trying to create uh, themselves like as, um, but so far they're charging artists for what we do, which is not what we're doing. We believe that because they are the best, we will support them and getting that for them. So I'm quite vocal in not being pro that because, you know, again, I think like a VC or like uh, signing a, a label, if you're talented for me, we should be investing in you. Um, you should not be charged for it. So um, I'm trying to kind of really show the difference between investing in people and having a service industry. I guess going back to, you know, the days of Picasso, an awful lot of these guys died poor. Um, so it's a... Uh, there is a huge element of, of um, I guess, uh, what's the word for it, where you're supporting the arts and you're you're sometimes almost taking a gamble that you may, may not make a return from it. Oh, is that a patron? Exactly, patronage, um, this, yeah. this sense of patronage. So patron for me is still more philanthropy. The issue is that... Sorry, philanthropy is exactly the word yeah. I was looking okay. for. Okay, there you go. So I guess the issue that I have with the charity world is that only a certain type of people can um, start giving like this in a charitable way. The reason is usually you'll be 50, 60, have done incredibly well, and then you're like, okay, I have this left amount of money, and then I can contribute. That's not good because that means that visual artists are only supported by 50 plus 60 years old, which I have no issues with as a demographic, but I have an issue by the fact that I don't want uh, which artists inspire everyone to be supported by a type of demographic. So... I much prefer a business approach so that all type of demographics can get involved in it and can support a different pricing and different stages um, than something that's really last stage. Uh, because it means that, again, my artists have the kids who are seeing their, um, you know, their public art projects in the streets. Um, they also have the millennials that have kind of got their first works and also the 50 to 60 plus years old and the head of marketing, so the head of museum. So, it means that they have a very diverse network that supports them. And again, I think that that's most representative of who they could be inspiring. So that's the only issue that I have with the patronage is it means that only the people who are very wealthy will be able to be patrons. And I don't really want just the wealthy to determine what art we get to see. Yeah, like you've expressed that very well, which helps me to to reframe my question, um, which effectively um, you've almost answered. And it's that issue that historically, how did people get supported? And it was the philanthropic element um, yeah. was huge. So there's so a big issue with that, because basically the museums that you get to see as a kid, it's not your history of art. It's a history exactly. of art that was able to be commissioned. Again, for me, the visual language is something that we all have. So when you're a baby, you don't learn to speak first. You learn to look at things first. So I have, um, I, you know, I think like music is something that everyone should be able to chip in and be part of um, and therefore, you know, pick the stars that represent them. And again, not something that feels very disparate from them, which is currently still the case. So is it a case that you are um, effectively um, democratizing philanthropic efforts or patronage? Yeah, I think in the same way that you have, you know, in the VC world, people who want to be behind companies that don't generate revenue, but are fantastic ideas. Um, I want people to be excited to be on the ride of an artist that's about to be successful. I don't think I'm a great person by supporting the artists or my team is. I think I'm lucky to be on the ride of people who are about to be really successful. So it's a very different way um, for me to be thinking of what it means to be on the ride of success. You know, your VC doesn't think he's lucky or he's a good person by supporting those companies. He just thinks those companies are about to be massive, which is why he's part of it. Uh, again, I believe my guys are going to be become massive and they're already on their way to success. So I'm just a lucky person here to be part of that ride. Oh, it's really incredible. Um, but uh, speaking to the VC piece, so a VC will typically have um, certain metrics and, and certain ideas and there's always going to be the good elements. But for example, uh, a VC might look at team or they might look at market opportunity. How yeah. do you measure your artists? Do you have any benchmarks or yeah, so have, have you figured anything out? Um, on the arts, so I look at like how innovative is the art, you know, the technique side of the art, but also the, the content. So my, my guys will be talking about cultural integration, sustainability, so all things that are very valuable in terms of content. In terms of the talent, I measure according to the person. So in the same way that a company is executed by a founder, that, you know, it's all about 
how great the idea is. That's just the start. It's about how great the execution will be. Um, it's the same with an artist. You know, I want people who are hardworking, ambitious, you know, uh, will be driving it for years. If they get told, no, they can't do that, they will still want to do it and they will still find ways to do it. So I look for, yeah, ambition, vision, experimentation, hard work. And that is in any talent industry. Like you, again, your sports team does not win just because it's the best. He also wins because he or she, because he was the most driven at trying to obtain that result. And that drive is, is a big part of the execution too. Yeah, so it's a very similar analogy then. You're, you're looking for attitude. So whether it's sport or business or art, that there, there are some critical uh, common success factors. I could not but ask you about Banksy. Um, how did you end up working with him and so, what was that like? Well, so my first boss, Steve Lazaridis, discovered him in Bristol. Wow. Um, so they did actually split uh, business-wise. So meaning that I was working more with the works uh, then I was working with Pictures on Walls, which is the company that now Banksy owns. Um, I think, you know, Street Art for me was a fantastic school because those are people that, again, are doing so well in the art market and the art industry sense, but they actually generally have changed the way people have access to art. I think thanks to Banksy, people know about art more and they interact with it a lot more uh, on the streets. And I think also there's a challenge of status quo. You know, Banksy has, has shown again that the artist was here to question things and, and to bring in a new vision from your politics, your adverts and your cities. So I think he has brought in um, a much bigger voice to a lot of street artists. So I think that's what I would say. I think working personally, I think is something that is very lucky with all people of talent. Um, but again, I think I ended up working more with Lazaridis after that, who had hundreds of paintings of his more than directly Banksy. Okay, so working with Banksy, uh, you know, going back to this um, this business piece, I kind of get the vibe from what I know about him publicly that he obviously has quite an intelligent business, quite an intelligent marketing head on him. Yeah. Um, would you agree with that from your experience of working with him? Completely, but I think for me, I didn't see marketing as a devil. I see it as something that's very valuable because if you if you understand how you engage audiences and, and you know, you make sure that message is being spread, then I think you're showing intelligence um, in doing it. So, of course, you know, Banksy understands how to spread the messages that he wants to spread really well. And you need a team like or like JR has a big team now behind him. Like it's, it's completely natural, especially if you're doing big things on the streets, like you can't do it on your own. Um, but I think marketing in that sense is more the spreading of ideas as a core cool idea of what marketing stands for. I really love the way you answer that question because straight away you refer to it as being a devil because um, from from my point of view, I'm coming from a business um, area and but also that there is the art element with the photography, but that I certainly uh, do definitely kind of shiver almost when I have to talk about money. Oh, that dirty thing. <laughs> But it's interesting yeah, that you're, it. you're immediate, you had a very, tool. but you had a very visceral response to that question. You straight away used the word devil. Is that a huge issue in art? That if you're seen to be business minded or marketing yourself, do you think that people can kind of go, oh, no, you can't do that? Well, yeah, but I think, again, it goes down to, you know, I'm based now in a country called England who's very based on social classes. So if you are incredibly privileged and do not need to worry for money, then of course you can start giving advice saying that um, you should not be talking about money, you should not be talking about marketing because you also have a very powerful network that will be doing the word of mouth. The reality is that 99% of people are not born in that. Um, so they marketing and business are tools for them to be leading the impacts and the ideas that they want to execute. So I think for me, the, a lot of the answers is to be fine in the social class system. And it might sound very French as a response, but it is it is very different um, from the country I come from, that here is so segmented and that money is seen as such the devil because it is just a tool. Money or marketing are tools to doing things that you really want to do. Um, and without spreading the word or without having the resources to do it, you just won't be able to do it. That's just the reality of it. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting answer because cultural differences um, can definitely come into play. And I come from Ireland, but my um, my father's lived in France for over 15 years. Um, and I'm also familiar um, with the UK. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting that it, it strikes me that um, th there is a cultural issue perhaps that depending on where you're from as an artist, 
will a little bit um I don't know if the word is is it correct to say influence but it will certainly affect your business model yeah I think it's it's again different like from what you say in your art to what your industry is I think your industry is influenced by its context I, I would hope that artists are more influenced by what they want to say and, and how they want to say it but of course you know your industry is convincing people that art can help you. So those people will be based in a specific context and, and there are different ways. You know, in America, the idea of success is much more accepted. Um, same with marketing and same with money in that sense. Of course, if you are in the social class system, responses will be different. Again, um, if you're much more social country like France, responses will be different again. So I think it's just, that's completely natural that the people you have to convince will change according to the different markets you're in um, culturally. French people, um, I, I found in my experience, are, are very good at, um, at standing up for themselves and, and for promoting themselves when they need to. But we have a cultural issue in Ireland whereby uh, people can find it very difficult to say, yeah, I'm the best in my industry. But if you go to for America, for example, and you don't back yourself, uh, there is the risk that people will will doubt your capabilities. So, uh, yeah, I think it's it's been a fascinating discussion on the cultural differences within different areas. So, in terms of uh, your own your own personal business, I mean, it's really incredible that you've managed to create this um, this spearhead business within an incredibly established industry. What's next on your roadmap, uh, personally so we and can in terms getting... of the business? So we're in a very exciting time because we're about to expand the company. So we're about to basically open different offices. So the second one will be in France. Um, again, back to those cultural differences. This afternoon, I'm on a Chinese TV interview and right. I'm learning about different countries and how different countries interact with the artists and how we can position our artists for that success to happen in each country as well. Amazing. Well, I'm just um, I'm blown away. This has been an incredible uh, well, I'm glad. An incredible conversation and I'm really excited about what you're doing. So, uh, Maureen, thank you so much for your time and for speaking with us today. My absolute pleasure. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.